before I start, thank you all, uh, EMCCM team, for supporting uh, me through this endeavor. Uh, before I begin, I know you guys love audience participation, and junior participation is very important in this. So I'm going to give you all guys the power to combine your abilities into the ability of the power of the resident. So give shout outs. There'll be some slides where you need to participate. Just give any shout out, shout out some answers. There's no wrong answers. There are wrong answers, but it's okay. Um, so we'll start off the case. This is all pre-hospital history. It starts off with a 63-year-old man who's a witness jump into the Hudson River, submerged for an unclear duration, pulled out by bystanders. There's no documented bystander CPR. There's no CPR. The downtime was approximately 10 minutes. And by the time EMS got there, the patient was found in VFib. It starts off. Uh, CPR was initiated, patient was defibrillated multiple times, intubated in the field, IO, epinephrine, amiodarone, ultimately achieved ROSC before being transported initially for stabilization to an outside hospital. By the time the patient arrives, the patient is found as asystole, has now received epinephrine again times four with bicarb and ROSC is achieved again. At this outside hospital, they note that the patient was bradycardic and presumably uh, hypotensive, was given atropine, started on norepinephrine, dopamine, eventually sedated with propofol and fentanyl. There were some blood works performed, an EKG was initially performed, and you guys are at Bellevue, by the way, surprise. Um, not much water in Brooklyn. So now, as the resident, give your shout outs. What's wrong with our ABCDs here? Is anything that stands out to you? In terms of our air where the patient's intubated, is a T collar in place? Um, so uh, presumably jumper, but we're not too sure from the ACR because there wasn't anyone actually, there wasn't an ACR actually given. Um, so we'll get, we'll get to that in a little bit on the next slide. Uh, so just, uh, just, Quick ABCDs, it's noted that the patient is intubated, has C collar, has bilateral breath sounds, has two plus distal pulses, and the GCS is noted as 3T, which is as low as you can get. The initial vital signs were as follows. Resident, give your, uh, give your shout outs here. What's the abnormal signs in the vitals? Yep, tachycardic hypothermic. Uh, presumably, this is a, at this point, the patient has arrived to your hospital on pressors. BP is currently 141 over 69, and the respiratory rate is at 19, 100% on intubated, on the ventilator. Um, as for our preliminary problem list, resident, give your shout outs. What current problems do you have at this point? Great, yeah, I heard hypothermia. Uh-huh, yep, tachycardia. Alter mental status, definitely. And uh, other things I thought of also were now at this point, patient is status post cardiopulmonary arrest and has also been submerged in water. Um, as for initial interventions, anything you guys want to do, resident? Yep. Temperature, I heard that. Yep. Labs, blanket, EKG. We'll do all that. Um, the team here decides to do. Level one trauma activation, uh, cardiac monitoring was placed on a bear hugger, was re-put on a fentanyl propyl infusion, had an EKG performed, had a bedside sono, as well as an ABG. Additionally, the placement was placed on their ventilator here, and we'll just make a note of this here, but the patient's PEEP is currently eight and has an FiO2 of 60%. Tidal volume is 460. There's no recorded uh, weight for this patient. 23 was, was respiratory rate. And as for our initial HPI, we don't really have much of anything. The patient uh, doesn't have any collateral information. Uh, there's no history in the chart. There's no no past medical history. There's no no uh, family or social history. So kind of working with blank slate. In terms of our initial exam, um, I'll just go through this relatively quickly and just go through the like, curtain positives. Basically, no signs of obvious trauma. There's no scalp hematoma, no skull fractures. They documented equal reactive pupils with extra aqua movements attacked. I don't know how much that is true. No septal hematoma, ranorrhea. There's an ET tube in place. There's no bruising or lacerations otherwise. There's normal chest excursion, two plus distal pulses. Active is non-tender, there's no step-offs. There's no bruising noted. 
And on neuro exam, the patient is intubated, sedated, and is also noted to be mild, minor biting at the tube. Now, for our differential, resonant, give us your differential. What are we thinking at this point? <laughs> yep, okay. Intracranial hemorrhage is what I heard now. Um, anything else you guys are thinking? Seizure, yep, seizure, aspiration, all great diagnoses. And uh, other things on our differential, uh, so at this point, we should be thinking about possible things that are related to submersion injury, ARDS, likely acute hypoxic respiratory failure and arrest, could have, uh, could have fallen due to drug overdose or cardiac dysrhythmias. And we'll go through some of our imaging at this point. Well, we'll go through some of our results at this point. So this was an initial primary hospital EKG done at the first hospital before the guy was transferred over. Resident, what do you see? Uh huh. I heard something with the STs, quiet whisper in the back, ST depressions. Okay. And elevations, AVR, B1. There's also um, anything else you guys have noticed? Maybe a little bit more subtle, but I can't show you. So these, these little notches right here, right after the R wave. Yeah. Um, so I heard Osborne waves and right. So we're seeing kind of these diffuse ST depressions with ST elevations to AVR and V1, which might be suggestive of like diffuse ischemia rather than localized like inferior walls, might be consistent with shock. There's also these Osborne waves, um, which are these, the notches in the downward portion of the R wave. Um, however, we also see these prolongations of the PR intervals, QRS complex, and QT intervals, which all might be consistent with like profound hypothermia. Um, the actual uh, computed, like the, the computer read was that the patient was an AFib. I don't, I don't, know, about, I don't know about that. Low well, voltage QRS, not so much. Um, computer read versus real person read. So now uh, at your hospital, you get a repeat EKG, you see this. Resident, what do you see? Yep, yeah. It looks, looks a lot different. And the uh, computer read was that there's no documented depression, documented depression by the providers here, um, but the computer reads that sinus, rhythm, short PR, otherwise normal EKG, but no other EKG is available. The only way I can really explain this is that the patient is now rewarmed or starting to become rewarmed, some pressors, less ischemia. Um, the bedside sauna performs, there's no imaging available, but what was documented was that EFATS was negative and there were B-lines diffusely. Your initial blood gas is as follows. Resident, any abnormalities in your blood gas? Great, yeah. Lactic acidosis. Um, let's just make a note of that PaO2 of 174. Let's keep that in the back of our head. Um, acidotic has its lactate of 10.6. Um, on the chemistry, it looks like the patient is also, chemistry associated with the blood gas, the patient is also hyperglycemic 237. Um, any other imaging, any of the labs, any consults you guys would put in at this point? Great. I'm hearing, I'm hearing scans, so pan scan. Um, in terms of labs, anything you guys would do? So we'll start off with some basics. Um, what do you mean by pan scan? Anything you guys mean particularly by pan scan in general? Um, Yep, so I'm hearing head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis. We'll start off with that. I'll even throw in like a free x-ray for you guys too. Um, in terms of the blood work, um, I'm seeing tox collapse also. In terms of consults, um, I gave it away before that the patient had a level one trauma activated. So trauma's on board at this point. Is there anything, you guys, anything else you guys would think about at this point or anything you guys want else for consults? So that's about it. You guys hit most of the stuff that the primary team did. So the, pa the patient did get all these things performed for ED. Um, as for our results now. So now we have um, our first set of blood works performed. Uh, resident, what do you see? Mm 
Yep. So negative alcohol level. I'll even throw in like some of the clear abnormalities, elevated anion gap with elevated white blood cell counts, small bandemia, and otherwise the rest of like the uh, uh, more of a screening labs negative coax were also not, not, abnormal, not significantly abnormal. Our first set of imaging studies came back. Resident, what do you see? Remember, no wrong answers, give your shout outs. It's a little bit difficult to see. Great, yeah. So here, ET tube is confirmed. Maybe some hyperinflation of lungs. Um, I'll give you guys just another device just to throw in a freebie there. There's an enteric tube in the stomach. You guys wait a little bit longer and now your results arrive. It looks like at this point, there's an endotracheal tube, there's an ET tube, there's an ice pack, but how most likely going to be impact at this point. There's some coarse lung markings, but mild interstitial edema is also a consideration. You get your CT scan back. It's a little bit quick. I'll let it run for a bit. Give you guys a hint, most of the findings, most of the significant findings are going to be in the brain. Anything blurred. you guys notice? Blurred gray white matter. Yeah, so uh, blurred, blurred gray, gray white matter. And then we get our final read back, waiting a little bit longer, and we see that at this point, there's global anoxic brain injury with effacement of the CSF spaces adjacent to the foramen magnum. There's no actual cervical spine injury, uh, no intra-abdominal injury, but there's noted to be a non displaced sternal fracture, as well as these mild dependent airspace opacities, which may reflect aspiration. So as for our updated problem list, we have all of our blood works back. We have our imaging studies back. What do we have as our problems at this point resonant? Great, anoxic brain injury, sternal fracture. Yep, lactic acidosis, respiratory failure, great. And so we hit most of it. Um, I just threw in submersion also, uh, interstitial pulmonary edema, cerebral edema with the effacements. And our consults are starting to come back. Trauma is noting that there's no injuries noted and these global anoxic brain injury and sternal fracture are likely in the setting of resuscitation. Throughout the course of the ED stay, the patient has been started on norepinephrine and vasopressin. You decide to start the patient empirically on vancomycin and zosin. And you notice something, there's a CT head that showed effacement and clinically there was also the sudden eye opening with simultaneous jerking simultaneous jerking movements, a flexion of the arms and adduction of the legs occurring like every 10 to 15 seconds. E consult neurocritical care, neurosurgery. The consults have returned. Um, they're very fast and they said there's, neurosurgery says there's no, neuro, neuro, no neurosurgical intervention indicated. Neurocritical care is concerned about the possibility for cerebral edema and myoclonic status. Their recommendations are to give mannitol, give levetiracetam load and load them with Depakote start a dazolam drip, and eventually perform a video EEG. The patient has these interventions performed, is maintained on a bear hugger, and is ultimately admitted to the medical ICU starting hospital day zero, which leads us to our diagnosis, drowning. Now, um, today I wanna to discuss, uh, I wanna to try to take away the mysticism of drowning. This isn't a diagnosis that we commonly see. I wanna define drowning, it's epidemiology, describe the physiology, complications, the treatment, and the prognosis. And so there's, uh, there, there were a lot of confusing terms in the past regarding drowning. However, there's one standard definition since 2002 established by the World Congress of Drowning. It's a process resulting in primary respiratory impairments from submersion or immersion in the liquid medium. 
there were complicated like terminology in the past to try to specify like what type of drowning it was, dry drowning, wet drowning. Um, this terminology is no longer used. It's used to refer to things, it's more used to like specify, it was used to specify like whether it was uh, uh, laryngospasm or not, but um, fresh water versus salt water was also uh, thought to, like was also used in the past to try to specify what type of drowning it was. And it was thought that fresh water might cause hemodilution and salt water with hemoconcentration, but this terminology is no longer used either. Drowning is like before, a process resulting in primary respiratory impairment from submersion or immersion. In the end, it causes hypoxia, hypoxemia, and uh, it comes with three specifiers now, with or without morbidity and with or without mortality. Um, I guess that's two. Uh, so now there's submersion injury. Uh, the epidemiology, it's like a leading cause of death worldwide, and especially in children under the age of five. It peaks at three points, it, like age demographic wise, those under the age of five, those between the ages of 15, 24 and the elderly. There's a lot of risk factors associated with drowning. Um, there's the medical risk factors as well as more environmental and more like social. So like lack of adult supervision, the inability to swim, alcohol, hypothermia are all environmental and more like medical disorders that might uh, cause someone to drown or predispose them to drowning. There's a nice chart in Cincinnati's, which kind of goes through other things that we should think about um, when uh, we think about risk factors for drowning. Um, that is to say, like, we should also be thinking about possibility of intentional drowning as well uh, that occurs in suicide, homicide, child abuse, and neglect. Um, there's uh, two things that, that lead to drowning. So immersion and submersion. Immersion is generally when your airway is above water and submersion is when your airway is below water. Both can ultimately uh, lead to drowning. With immersion, you have, you could be immersed in cold water or hot water. When you're immersed in cold water, there's a cold water response that leads to gasping, hyperventilation, increased cardiac output, peripheral vasoconstriction and hypertension. Ultimately, this leads to increasing your metabolic rate and decreasing your breath hold time. You become fatigued, you go underwater, you drown. Um, you can also have what's called uh, autonomic conflicts uh, in cold water immersion, which ultimately increases your rate of arrhythmia as well. Um, what happens is that there's also like, uh, there's both parasympathetic and sympathetic activation, which innervates the heart and could like predispose people with underlying channelopathies or myocardial hypertrophy, long QT, long QT syndromes um, to having arrhythmias. And hot water immersion, uh, normally when you're hot, you'll have your skin temperature increase, you'll have cutaneous vasodilation, eventually you sweat and your heart rate will go down. In hot water immersion, however, there's impaired thermoregulation. You'll have your skin temperature increase, you'll have cutaneous vasodilation. However, you're not sweating, you'll have now decreased peripheral va vascular resistance your heart rate increases. And then when you get out of the water, you have decreased hydrostatic tension, hydrostatic, um, decreased hydrostatic forces, which leads you to eventually become orthostatic, pass out, go into the water, become submerged and then drown. Um, when you're submersed, there's physiologic, uh, physiologic mechanisms that can be protective against drowning, can also lead to it as well. Your diving response in particular is um, something that uh, less mammals we all have. It's an, it's uh, activation of your sympathetic and parasympathetic responses, which ultimately leads to peripheral vasoconstriction, hypertension, and bradycardia. Um, it's meant to decrease your metabolism selectively, and it could be affected by things like temperature, uh, physical fitness, and it can be protective in young children. Um, breath holding is another like physiologic thing that could be protective. And breath holding, the average maximum breath hold time in warm water is about 45 seconds. Things that affect breath hold time is mainly something called your alveolar, your, your alveolar uh, uh, PCO2 breakpoint. Um, we all have uh, receptors in our lungs, which kind of detect the levels of carbon dioxide. At around 60 to 90 seconds, we reach a threshold at which point it triggers a respiratory drive. You go under, you're, you're holding your breath, your PCO2 rises above a certain threshold breakpoint. Your respiratory drive activates, you take a breath. Um, things that can extend your breath hold time are things that can, are things that kind of stimulate your respiratory drive. So swallowing can extend your breath hold time. 
things that could decrease your breath all time are things like your metabolic rate, hyperventilation, psychological tolerance, and more environmental things. Alcohol, cold water temperature can decrease your breath all time as well as voluntary aspiration. I didn't know this in the initial pre-hospital history, but this case took, took place sometime during the course of November. So at this, at this time of year, like the Hudson's around 11 to 12 degrees Celsius, it's pretty cold. Um, However, breath holding can also lead to submersion as well. Um, yeah, there's something called shallow water blackouts. This typically happens when uh, you have loss of consciousness at the end of a breath hold dive. What happens is that you, uh, a person might hyperventilate. They lower their initial CO2 levels in their body. It takes longer for them when they go underwater to reach the CO2 threshold to, to trigger the respiratory drive. But what happens instead is that all, the all that time that they're underwater, their oxygen levels are going down past the point where they can maintain consciousness, the blackout, become submerged, pass out, drown. So in the end, um, immersion, submersion, it leads to aspiration of water and impaired gas exchange, which leads to hypoxemia, um, ischemia, and globally in the body, this can cause a lot of different things. In the brain, it might cause anoxia, diffuse neuronal damage, cerebral edema in the lungs. It could cause a picture that looks a lot like ARDS, pulmonary edema, laryngospasms on the heart. You should also, also consider like the environmental aspects. So severe hypothermia might cause things like arrhythmias, such as asystole, PEA, and BFib. And then in the kidney uh, with shock and hypoxemia, you might have ventral renal failure. As for treatment, um, treatment primarily uh, revolves around like initial resuscitation and then post resuscitation. So initially, um, starting from the starting from like the uh, the rescue of the patient itself, um, there's a saying: reach, throw, row, don't go. And the saying you should it, it's something that you should remember when thinking about rescuing, starting off with just rescuing a patient. Um, basically, it's ways to try to save someone without endangering yourself as well. Um, there's a high prevalence of fatal and non-fatal drownings in untrained persons attempting to perform in-water rescues. So you shouldn't perform a uh, water rescue without having the formal training, ideally. Start off with things easy, uh, like reaching for the patient with a stick, throwing something that's float, let, that floats, Rowing to patient if you're on a paddle boat, um, but don't actually go into the water yourself. In water resuscitation is something, so kind of related to uh, like the rescue of the patient. Um, this is something I just found interesting when I was doing my reading, but there's a lot of conflicting information, or at least I had a lot of conflicting thoughts about what's the safest thing to do in a submerged vehicle. And apparently the safest time to uh, escape a submerging vehicle is when it immediately enters the water during the initial floating phase. Don't try to do something fancy like wait till the vehicle completely submerges, then break the window or like breathe air in the passenger compartment. Get out as soon as it as, as soon as it submerges. If it remains floating, go on top. If it's sinking, move away and go towards safety. Um, in water resuscitation is something that was described in the 1970s and it wasn't shown to actually have a positive outcome until 2004. Uh, in water resuscitation refers to ventilation, not compression by rescuers into water. And in 2004, when it was shown to have a positive outcome, it was in a study done with uh, Brazilian lifeguards with helicopter support. And what they showed was that it does have positive, it does have improvement in survival and neurological outform, out outcomes when performed by these great Brazilian lifeguards with, with, uh, with helicopter support. However, compared to lay, uh, lay rescuers, it just increases the overall rescue time, difficulty, the number of submersions and aspirations. Basically, um, don't perform in-water resuscitation if you're not a trained Brazilian lifeguard you can do this. It makes sense. You're in moving water. You're trying to support yourself. You're trying to support someone else. And uh, it's just a very like complex thing that you want to coordinate. It just increases the time for the patient to be removed from the water, to be extricated, and chest compressions. It it it, it uh um it prolongs the time to chest compressions as well. Um, in terms of the initial resuscitation, going further on, uh, ABCs as opposed to CAB, 
uh, you want to con the the primary insult is generally by like hypoxemia, and so you want to support the airway. Um, the a lot of this information is coming from is from like the wilderness society as well. Uh, oxygen is uh, oxygen is recommended and should be delivered at the highest concentration available with positive with positive pressure. Uh, preferred in patients in respiratory distress or rest. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of compression only CPR, it's likely to show little benefit, and most of your resuscitation should actually uh, more focus on maintaining the airway and providing oxygen. Um, VFib apparently is rare in drowning episodes, so the incorporation of the AD should, shouldn't actually interfere with your oxygenation and ventilation. And you should use an AED if you have it available. It's not actually contraindicated in a wet environment, apparently, according to the Wilderness Society. Um, apparently, Heimlich, uh, Dr. Heimlich, and Dr. Heimlich used to promote uh, the Heimlich maneuver in drowning patients or drowned patients. Um, this is not something that's recommended, and its use just delays the delivery of ventilation, and it's also a little bit tricky in patients who might have cervical spinal injury. In the end, the cervical spinal injury in drowned patients is actually relatively uncommon. And so uh, in drowned patients without obvious signs of trauma or known falls or diving events, restricting the spinal motion may actually just delay the removal from the water. It might obstruct the airway and it's a routine, immo routine immobilization is just not indicated unless, there you, ha unless you have a severe injury that's apparent or it's consistent with the, with the history. In terms of your post-resuscitation period, um, you want to treat, you want to recognize and treat hypothermia. Um, hypothermia is uh, paradoxically protective, but then patients who are in a walk who are in the water for a long period of time might become hypothermic, and a prolonged submersion time is not protective. Um, severe hypothermia should be should be corrected. You can consider warming the patient to the point of relative cooling, like 32 to 34 degrees Celsius, although there isn't really much strong evidence towards this. Um, although pneumonia may be common after drowning, empiric antibiotics are not recommended. Um, corticosteroids are also not recommended. And mechanical ventilation should ultimately uh, follow the ARDS protocol. You can consider non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, although we all know that patients who are altered or have uh, comp or have potential for aspiration, uh, you should be avoided. Now, in terms of our patients, um, just going back to this, going back to our patients' presentation, um, you love doing PF PF ratios, and just like in the back of your mind, you calculated that it was like two ninety in our case. We saw those bilateral opacities, and um, in our case, he actually meets the definition of mild ARDS. Um, Although like current treatment for these drowned patients in the ICU, uh, the, the treatment revolves around like treating these patients as if, as if they were uh, patients with ARDS, these drowned patients actually tend to recover faster and late sequelae are, are more uncommon. Um, still, it's not best to initiate weeding for at least 24 hours because local pulmonary injury might not have resolved and pulmonary edema could just recur. Um, you want to uh, follow the ARDS protocol, which means typical ARDS things like uh, starting your tidal volume at six milliliters per kg, augmenting your tidal volumes and respiratory rate to maintain a plateau pressure of less than 30, and then uh, augmenting your PEEP and your FiO2 to try to maintain a partial pressure of oxygen between 55 to 80 millimeters mercury. The goal is to maximize and maintain your alveolar recruitment and to improve your oxygenation while limiting your oxygen toxicity. Um, in terms of like more post resuscitation thoughts, so was there a role for targeted temperature management? Not so much. Fortunately, there's just not very strong evidence that supports therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest, specifically due to drowning, um, not even in children. And in terms of like more brain oriented management, there are things that for poor, uh, that confer like a poor prognosis. So myoclonic or EG status epilepticus confers poor outcome. However, not many therapies have shown to affect outcome. Trial of anti-epileptics can be considered, but it's unclear whether this actually does anything. ICP monitoring doesn't show any benefit, even mannitol. 
it could be considered, but in the studies where mantle was used, um, there haven't been any uh, intact survivors or, or there haven't been um, uh, significant, there, there, there uh, was, it, it just didn't work. Um, in terms of the, the best treatment, unfortunately, it's just good prevention. So the tenets of uh, prevention just revolve around keeping yourself safe, keeping others safe. Um, learn swimming, swim with others, obey all the safety signs and warning flags, don't go into the water after drinking alcohol, uh, avoid, avoid inflatable swimming aids, know how to use a life jacket, know the weather, uh, know how to stay away from rip currents. Uh, apparently, fence, uh, fencing in a pool on four sides and installing a self-closing, self-latching gate reduces the incidence of drowning by 50 to 70%. And this is a mandated thing in New York State. Um, provide a warning sign of shallow water and pool as well. Basically, keep yourself safe, keep others safe, and prevent drowning in the first place. There's good resources on this from everyone, including the Academic uh, Academy of Pediatrics, as well as CDC. And there's even like an um, international water safety organization that promotes uh, safe, uh, safe water habits. In terms of prognostication, um, in asymptomatic drowning patients, these, can be, these patients can usually be clinically observed for four to six hours. And in the end, um, less than 6% of patients who are rescued actually need medical attention in a hospital. Um, however, for symptomatic patients, basically if you need CPR, that's pretty bad. Um, there are things that can improve prognosis like early basic life support, ACLS, apparently a reduction in brain temperature by ten, just, just 10 degrees Celsius doubles the duration the brain can survive. However, when you're in the water that long that your body cools down, um, the time you're in the water, your submerged time confers a worse prognosis. So in a small study with like 61 patients, there weren't any intact survivors found, a neurologically intact survivors found after 15 minutes and no survivors found at all after 60 minutes. This was at any temperature. Um, there was a nice, uh, there was, uh, Old study, very nice, done back in like 1970s with 41,000 patients, which just looked at um, uh, which classified and risk stratified patients just based on like their uh, clinical uh, clinical presentation, and they were able to show that you know the it's hard to see, but for a lot of the asymptomatic patients, these patients have a very good survival. For the symptomatic patients, their survival is poor. Um, our patient would fit into this seven to 12% survival pathway. He's just one grade away from a forensic evaluation. Um, in the end, our patient, he was transferred to MICU on day one. They actually, prop, uh, they actually uh, opted to start targeted temperature therapy in the MICU. The trauma service signed off right away. Day two, the patient was found to be febrile, even on the targeted temperature therapy. And the patient was also noted to have dilated, unreactive pupils without brainstem reflexes. On day three, there was a goals of care conversation held with the family, plans to withdraw care. And on day five, the patient expired. There's a palliative extubation, extubation performed with the family at bedside. So just some takeaway points. Um, I just want to take away the mysticism behind drowning. Um, there's a lot of confused terminology and most of it's just out of date. Drowning is immersion, submersion, with, with respiratory impairment, with or without mortality, with or without morbidity. Um, most patients who get rescued don't actually need to go to the ED. They can usually be observed. And um, don't forget your ABCs. Ventilation and oxygen is paramount. You can get fancy with these neuroprotective strategies, possible targeted temperature therapies, but a lot of these haven't really proven benefit in the end. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Um, so there, there is there, I haven't really done much reading into the ECMO, um, but it's, yeah, the literature's out there. Um, I guess the basic tenants are just gonna revolve around their airway ventilation support. Um, and again, most of these patients, most of the drowned patients are usually not gonna be in the hospital. 
um, that can be clinically observed, unless they're very bad. And then you could consider all the pure adjunctive therapies. Uh, I think as you said, it's primarily a For those at home. So those at home, Dr. Wills was saying that uh, these patients who are asymptomatic, you might also want to consider doing a chest x-ray as well to rule out a possibility of pneumonitis. And also uh, it's primarily the disease processes like ARDS and the rest of the body might be okay. So you want to support their ventilation and oxygenation. The other thing is these patients, a lot of them young, Definitely. They're hypothermic too. So, they're, so Dr. Sander was saying that a lot of these patients are young, healthy people before they drown. You might want to consider the possibility of organ donation and be aggressive in trying to uh, facilitate organ donation as well. All right.